Hello, 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 everyone. We are back finally with one more presentation. Again, good morning, good evening, good night. I'm here with a good friend of mine who we had an amazing opportunity to be host again twice this month, right? Hello, Nicholas. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm very, very fine. And you? I'm fine as well. Better now because I feel at home. <laughs> so, uh, Today, we, you will talk about migrating from imperative to reactive, right? So that looks amazing. And if you don't know Nicholas, Nicholas is DevHell Advocate at Hazelcast. Please follow him on Twitter because he has amazing materials, amazing blogs, amazing uh, presentation around the globe. Right now, everything becomes closer because of the internet. And Nicholas, the show is yours. Thank you to be your host again. And I give you a space. Thanks, Otario. That was a very nice introduction. Um, feel free to stay in the stream. Again, I have been presenting for one year um, and speaking to myself. So the more people I can see, the better it is when I do my presentation. So you already introduced me. I believe this slide is just like not that useful, um, just something very important. I'm not a reactive guru. Um, so what I will present now is, is something from the ground up, is uh, not something very theoretical. I think it can be applied. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Um, just an introduction, we have two products. The first one is an in-memory data grid. And if you don't know what an in-memory data grid is, you can think about it has replicated data structures. So instead of having a map uh, inside a single GVM, you can shore it or it can replicate it across several GVMs. The other one is an in-memory stream processing engine, but I won't talk about any of them today. So this talk is about migrating from, uh, uh, from uh, sorry, <laughs> from, um, fuck. <laughs> imperative to reactive, I forgot the word. Um, so let's define what is reactive. The, I mean, there were mentions of reactive before 2014, but the first time where it was really like defined, it was in the reactive manifesto. And the reactive manifesto states four properties of a reactive system. The first one is to be responsive. So uh, the idea is you, you should be as fast as possible. The second is it should be resilient. So even if something bad happens, you still get something. It might not be what you expect, but you still get, still get something. Your system is not stuck. The third one is, is it, it, it's elastic. So um, it, it scales nicely, perhaps not linearly, but let's say the ideal would be close to linear. And the fourth item is it's message driven. So it, it's only about message passing. It's not by uh, calling directly methods, it's message passing, and they are asynchronous. And the idea behind this manifesto is was about the actor model. So the actor model was already a design on the OTP Erlang platform. So it doesn't come from the GVM world. And on the Erlang platform, you have this actor model that is basically like backed into the platform. And the idea that you have dedicated actors and then you can just send message to one actor, the message will be put in a queue and the actor will process them. And the, the, the most fundamental idea is that uh, each actor has its own state. So in order to exchange state between one other actor, you send a message to it with the payload that you want. And fun part is that this actor model um, is actually not the model that we uh, see right now as the like, like most important implementation of, of reactive system. The most important uh, implementation of reactive systems that I've seen is the reactive streams. So it still tries to uh, handle whatever the reactive manifest manifesto um, tells, but in slightly different way. So the idea behind the reactive streams is you still have uh, like one, one, I wouldn't say call them actor, but one event loop, you still have a message queue. So every request goes 
into this message queue. Oh, sorry, I am in the wrong one. Uh, every request go into this message queue, and then the event loop will process them one by one and pass them to an event handler. And the important stuff is that the event loop is, is non-blocking, and event handler, they do their own stuff in their own thread. So the question now is, why should we go reactive? There are good reasons for that. There are not so good reasons for that. Um, so the, in my opinion, the not so good reason is it's web scale. So the idea is that uh, on, the, on the normal system, on the non-reactive system, you are limited by the number of threads of the operating system. Because when you receive a request, you may, we, your application server will map a thread to another thread, and you are pretty limited. And that's probably one of the biggest arguments uh, I see on Reactive, and it's one of the worst. Because until you reach that limit, you still have a lot of margin. You have a lot of buffer. Um, most companies, they won't reach that limit soon. And you know that premature optimization is the root of all evil. So designing your system from the scratch to be reactive for this reason is, in my opinion, not a great way to do that. The other reason, which I believe is perhaps uh, much better suited, is it's more cloud-friendly. When you are hosting your on-premise infrastructure, then you develop your software. You don't care whether to be reactive or op to optimize the number of CPU cycles or to optimize the usage of memory because the infrastructure is there. So you can waste some stuff. That's not that important. Now, when you move to the cloud, you will be built for every CPU, in uh, CPU instruction by uh, CPU time. You will be built by memory and stuff. So in, in that case, it might make a bit more sense to use reactive for this reason. However, there is no such as a free launch, and there are definite downsides of, of reactive programming. The first one is a more complex mental model. Um, actually, when you program in an imperative way, you write your code, you call a method, the method will be actually called at runtime, and it will be a request response model. Now, when you do the same stuff in reactive, uh, calling a method just makes you subscribe to something. So the API is, is, an, is an abstraction layer. And at runtime, there will be message subscription. So uh, putting a breakpoint, for example, will be much, much harder. Or at least you, you need to know where to put the breakpoint in the right way. Uh, something that I find very hard, for example, is uh, now you've got a, a new set of specific APIs that you need to know. And since probably at the beginning you don't know them, uh, I mean, the method I'm using is to call um, my reactive guru. Uh, and in that case, I will cite him. It's Oleg Dokuka. And, and, and ask him, hey, I want to do that. Uh, I, I, how can I do it? Um, and then he points me to the right uh, method. And, and until that point, it will be very hard to uh, to write an application from scratch. And finally, um, the idea of reactive is you have message passing all along the cold chain. And as soon as you block, you block the whole chain. So you need to make sure that there is no blocking call in the chain. As soon as you've got one blocking call, well, you are not reactive anymore. You are blocking again. The basic API is actually very, very simple. You have only four building blocks or interfaces. You have um, the publisher API and the publisher API subscribe to a subscriber. The subscriber has four methods on subscribe and you pass in the subscription. Subscription itself can request like the next n items or cancel it. So that means that actually here you can see the back pressure already. So you can ask for n items, as, as, as many items as, as you are able to process. So uh, uh, um, a fast producing publisher won't overflow a slow processing subscriber. And then you've got on next to get the next item. Then you've got on error if something bad happens. And then you can successfully complete. And because we will be chaining the publisher and the subscriber, there might be some steps in between. We have a processor, which is both a publisher and a subscriber. So it will be a publisher for a next item in the chain and a subscriber.
subscriber on the previous item in the chain. And then the, 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 those body blocks, they don't do anything on their own. You see they are interfaces, so you actually need to do uh, something. You need an implementation, so you can write your own implementation, but it will be a long, long work, or you can use an already existing implementation. Uh, so because the demo I will be showing afterwards is based on Spring and Spring Boots, I will talk a bit about Project Reactor. And I believe most people, uh, especially if they are working with Spring, they are quite familiar with Project Reactor. Re Project Reactor is an implementation of um, the reactive stream. So instead of having like this interface of publisher and you need to do stuff yourself, you've got a flux which can uh, like map zero to like infinite number of items or mono, which can map to zero or one item. The interesting bit about that is that Project Reactor is not dependent on Spring. Spring uses, uh, is dependent on Project Reactor, but Project Reactor has no uh, dependencies on, on Spring. It has dependencies on the reactive streams. And if you are more interested in uh, GDK classes, you might, know about the GDK9 flow class. And that's very interesting because in the GDK9 flow class, you can find also the four building blocks that I've shown you, like the publisher, subscriber, processor, and subscription. And the idea, at least that you can see in the reactive streams uh, website is that, hey, right now we are providing those interfaces in this package, but as soon as the interfaces will be brought in into the GDK, we will use them. And it was written in, uh, I don't remember when, but GDK9 happened in 2017, and they are still using the package .reactive streams. So that's a bit an interesting take. However, if you need to uh, switch between the GDK9 classes and the org reactive teams, streams classes you can uh, interfaces actually you can use this package called flow adapters and you can switch between them and now since i told you i would be talking a bit about spring you are probably using the spring web framework and since the version 5 which is already a couple of years ago uh, it supports reactive types how does it support reactive types by a new project called spring web flux which has a dedicated package, a dedicated namespace. And how does it compare with Spring MVC? Actually, it compares like only in, in, in its implementation. So uh, you might be aware that Spring MVC, for example, can now be configured with API in a more functional way. It's called Web MVC FM. Well, Spring Web Flux can as well. And probably the way you are using Spring AVC is through annotations and Spring Web Flux can also be configured through annotations. So the only difference is the implementation, like one is like blocking, the other is reactive. So the most straightforward way would be, hey, let's reuse our annotation and just change the underlying engine from Spring MVC to Spring Web Flux. If you start like that, it might seem to work, but you might miss a lot of the finer points of how it works. And so you would believe that it works this way, but because the implementation is Spring Web Flux and not Spring Web MVC, it will work another way and it will bite you back. And probably that's not what you want. So the idea in this demo is I will start from a Spring MVC application with annotation. Then I will migrate to functional API and then I will migrate from Spring MVC to Spring Web Flux using the same functional API. And because there will be a different way to configure it, then if you are familiar with Spring MVC with annotations, we will, you will like feel that something is very, very different. Even though actually, as I mentioned, you can use Spring MVC with functional API. So I've talked a lot already and I don't like to talk. I want to show you. So let's uh, have some demo codes. So here I created, um, oh, I don't see the code. Yes, now I see it. Um, I, I, I've created uh, an existing project on start.spring.io. You can see I'm using the latest version. Um, I'm trying to use uh, also not an old Java version, although nothing prevents you to. It's a standard application. It's just a 
toy project. So you have Spring, Spring Bootstarter that a GPA, I have Spring Bootstarter web, uh, because I want to use some caching, especially at the beginning in Hibernate, I will be uh, considering my Hibernate second level cache with Hazel cost. So I get also I need the integration. That's pretty stupid because I'm using an in-memory uh, database. So having an in-memory data grid in front of an in-memory database is useless. But here you can imagine it could be Postgres, MySQL, whatever. It's just for uh, the purpose of this demo is much easier to use an in-memory database. At any point, if you've got question, Otavio is actually like watching the interaction on YouTube, on Slack, on Twitter, wherever. And so uh, I will be very happy if you have questions because I want this talk to be very clear to you. So that at the end that you, you, you know what you can do and whether it fits your context or not. So thanks again to Otago. So the application itself is pretty like simple. As I mentioned, you just have like a main class with the Spring Boot application annotation. I've got a dummy entity uh, with ID, first name, last name, birth date properties. And I have my controller because that's what every Spring MVC project has. It's a REST controller. I have a repository that I inject this repository because I'm using Spring Data GPA. I don't need to provide any implementation. It's provided for me by Spring Boot. I love Spring Boot for that. So I don't need to write like custom code. And I have two endpoints. The first one is to get all persons and the second one is to get one single person by its ID. And because I'm using uh, Spring Boot and, and Hibernate and all the good stuff, I have this data.sql. So at the beginning of the application, I will get all the entities like directly inserted into the database. That's just again for demo purposes. Probably you would uh, like in real life, I fly away or whatever. So let's start this application and let's see how it reacts. And then we can go further and uh, see what steps are necessary to migrate. And my machine is a bit slow at the moment. So um, I hope that you will pardon me if it's not as smooth as I want it to be. Like for example, now it's building for ages and I already built it before. Um, so um, yeah, I hope that uh, you will excuse me. So the application is starting yeah. and it loads Hazel costs. And again, Hazel cost is used as a second level cache. And here I've, I, I've enabled the Hibernate statistics because uh, during this demo, during my migration, uh, you will see that I will lose the Hazelcast integration with Hibernate because at some point I will let go of Hibernate. I want, and at the end, I, I will need it to get it back. And you will see it's not as easy as you want it to be. So, like migrating from imperative, migrating from imperative to reactive, might have some challenges around the way, and uh, I want you to be aware of them. So now I can uh, curl. So I will curl the first. Uh, item and if I check the log, the log tells me, hey, so there was one cache miss because my cache is now completely uh, cold. I've started the application anew. And then uh, then it, there was some GDBC statement. So I there was interaction with the database and afterwards there was one put. So now the um, entity should be in the cache if I ask for it again. And then I've got it in the cache. So now I have one cache hit. I have no interaction with the database and I have no miss. And I'm very happy. And, and for that to work, I just need to provide a hazelcast.xml because it's integrated with Spring Boot. And otherwise I have some uh, integration uh, with, Hazel, uh, with Hibernate second level. So I need to configure it to use a second level cache. And then to tell, it, to tell it, hey, I will be using this as a system. And then that's cool. So that's my starting point. And as I mentioned, I want first to move to a more functional way of um, configuring Nicholas? application. Nicholas? Because otherwise, if we just like change the underlying engine, Nicholas? yes. Uh, unfortunately, your audio is yes. has some uh, issue. Your... I don't know if because your ID is consuming a lot of memory. But That's bad. Do you hear me better now? Yes, better now. 
uh, it will be very hard for me to keep this. So I will try to speak a bit louder. Uh, I need my hands to type on the keyboard, but I will try to do my best. So perhaps I can like make my mic here and it will be closer to my mouth. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Okay, thank uh, you. If at any point it's it's still uh, it's it's wrong again, then just interrupt me. So again, uh, the idea is now I start uh, from WebMVC and I will like step by step migrate to uh, um, Reactive. But if I just replace the engine and I keep the annotations, you will feel something familiar, but it will be very different. So I want everything to be very different so that you are aware that something uh, actually the implementation is also different. So I want a live code everything because uh, I mean there will be always some bugs and whatever. So I will uh, have uh, the git repository do that for me. So the first ID what we, we what the first thing we do is actually we replace the person controller by what we call routes. And the idea is now we don't have the REST controller anymore. What we have is like a simple configuration class. And we don't have the mappings anymore. We have just regular beans and they, um, they return a route function. And a route function, like it, it, its name implies, is just like it routes stuff. So it will uh, get um, a request and return a, a response. And so I just like migrated from this like annotation based model to a more functional stuff. So here I will uh, use these uh, utility method routes and you can see that it's like I will get it. And then the mapping that I'm using is person. And then I have this like function in the sense of like a, a Java interface function that actually like accepts a request, a server request and returns a server response. Um, so it, there is a lot of stuff that before was implicit that I make explicit here. For example, I say, hey, I return a 200 code. And before it was just implicit. And with this 200 code, I will return this, this body. So you, you can craft the, um, the, um, the response however you want. The idea is that, uh, again, from annotation to more functional. And of course, we are still using annotation, but they are not related to the MVC model. They are just related to like standard uh, Spring Boot um, annotations or oh, Spring annotation, not Spring Boot annotation. Let's check that we keep everything working because sometimes we might, I might have uh, some like band surprises. So I will just again curl and make things that everything works. So we have still like zero hit, one miss, one put. We redo it again and it still works. So I'm very happy that with, with this uh, step, but it, we, we are still like doing regular web MVC blocking. Now, the idea now is to move this like lo routing logic into their dedicated class. So it's, I wouldn't say a pattern, but you see it a lot on the Spring Boot blogs and articles and, and whatever. So we put that in a dedicated place. So I will just like move that and it's just like stupid refactoring. It's not very interesting. It's just that now we have a person handler that we uh, like inject with the repository. And now we have this get all method that has the name and get all method that has a name. And our rounds now are just like a bit, look a bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. We just inject now the person handler instead of injecting the person repository. It's just a direct. Uh, refactoring. So no big deal here. I don't need to test it. It's just the same. The next step is a bit more interesting because um, it's about how you organize your router functions. Um, so you could have one mapping, uh, one, one bean, sorry, method for each uh, route that you create, or you can factor them into different ones. 
So the idea is that, hey, let's factor them into different ones. And for example, everything that is related to person, you have a dedicated route. So you could have like modules, not Java 9 modules, but like say packages or whatever, or features or capabilities related to person, and they return a single route. So let's just let's try this one because uh, this is a bit more involved and I don't want to uh, have any issues with that. But otherwise, it's still the same. You still, sorry, define uh, the mapping, and then you have a builder, and the builder you tell, hey, I will get, I will post, I will delete, whatever. Then you have the sub uh, context and what you will be doing. And again, uh, this needs uh, to be a function. And now it should work. I will just check that. Uh, yeah, it's taking a bit of time again. I hope that my application is working. Yes, I have the put. Everything is working as expected. And at this point, I am like finally ready. At this point, everything is still imperative, but I'm ready to migrate to reactive. And if we look at the stuff that needs to be changed, we can see that it's pretty straightforward. It's not like completely straightforward. The only thing that we need to do is to change web MVC with WebFM dependency. Let me, uh, my, my machine is just dying. I don't know why. Uh, last time it happened, it was about Kubernetes. I, I, I had a lot of stuff running, but here Nicholas, I don't understand why. Unfortunately, so again. Still Nicholas. doesn't. Yeah. Uh, okay. Your audio uh, so I was just telling. Hearing. Yeah, I don't know what's happened. Maybe bandwidth. Uh, if you can be closer to your router. Yeah, I will. I will quit Firefox. <laughs> I will quit the terminal. Uh, I believe it's a problem that I am consuming a lot of resources. That uh, the stream is consuming too many resources. Um, so I just told that actually this step is the easiest one, um, but the most fundamental one. Now I'm changing the web MVC artifact by the web flux artifact. And that's all. That's all what I'm doing here. And I just like well, just uh, need to change uh, the route, so I will do it. Yeah, Firefox seems to be the culprit. The only thing that I change is here, you can see that the, 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 the type names, they are the same. They are just in a, in a different package name. So actually, that's the easiest one. Of course, now I'm, I'm not uh, like returning the server response directly. I'm returning a mono now we are returning reactive types. So um, when this, um, this, application, this method is called, it's not that it will be called and then it will be returning a response. Then you will subscribe. And at the right point, you will return a mono of server response. And let's check that it still works. There is another change that we have had to do is here you can see that there is a body value instead of a body. Uh, and the reason is that here we are still returning a, like a normal non-reactive type. And in order to match between the world of reactive and the world of imperative, we have to call this body value. And then we will be switching to uh, like fully reactive afterwards and we can we will change back to from body value to body. And now it takes ages to build. I will speak closer to the mic, but I'm, I think it's not an issue. It's really my uh, computer that's dying. So it takes a bit of time again. That's a good thing. That means that I can go back to my boss and ask for a like faster computer. Um, if he accepts. Now I can check that it works. And yes. So as you can see here, everything still works. There is still the cache working. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, as I mentioned before, we have one part of the application, the like web part that is reactive, 
and that access port that is not reactive. So our application cannot be considered reactive. We just change a lot of stuff for um, like zero benefits. So the next step is much more involved. Now we need to change everything to reactive. And I, I wanted to do in two different steps because there is a lot, there are a lot of changes. So the first thing that we uh, need to do is of course to uh, change the dependencies. So if we change to reactive, that means that we don't have a Spring Boot starter data GPA. There is a Spring data R2DBC, so no starter. And there is no H2, there is a R2DBC H2. So we need a dedicated driver to access the database in a reactive way. And that means no more GPA, and that means no more Hibernate. And because of that, that means no more integration with Hazel cost. So by migrating our data access to reactive, we just lost caching, which might not be so great. I want my cache. Uh, OK, we will put it back at the end. Um, but so far, it seems to be working. Uh, we will just be checking that everything works. But since time is flying, perhaps I shouldn't check every now and then. It would be great if it actually started. F10, no, F10 is here. Nah. I think that I will stop uh, showing you that it works between every uh, change. Uh, because my machine is really like dying for whatever reason. I don't know. That would be a good postmortem. And now it builds. So you, you will probably need to uh, believe me afterwards um, that everything works as intended. Uh, there will be the Git repository. So you can check by yourself. You can uh, like uh, clone, fork it, whatever, and, and check for yourself that I'm, I'm not uh, lying to you. So last time I check. And afterwards, I will be like just switching the Git steps. Yes, it has started. I check. So it's still working. And of course, now I don't have caching anymore because I don't have Hibernate anymore. So no Hibernate uh, second level cache. That's a bit sad. Um, OK, now I'm telling you, hey, everything is reactive. And you trust me because you are nice people. But um, actually, you shouldn't do that. You should be really, really sure that no color is blocking. So there is a dependency called uh, block hound. And the idea behind block hound is it will detect if there is a blocking call on the wrong thread. Um, and to uh, like install block hound is very easy. You just say, hey, block out install. So block hounds will uh, like uh, use a Java agent, which means that's, that's probably not what you want to do in production. Production, you probably will want to have like a pro dedicated profile uh, to say, hey, I don't want to post on block hound. Or on the other way around, you would have a dev profile and you say, hey, if I have the dev profile, I want to install block hound. But in production, I don't want block hound at all which is a good idea. And with this, you can be sure that no call is blocking. If a call is blocking, then it will be intercepted by block count and it will throw a runtime exception. So now that we are sure that no call is blocking, we can go a bit further and we can add a feature that I didn't add before is now I want to say, hey, if uh, the uh, entity was not found in the database, instead of returning nothing, I want to throw a 404. So we can discuss whether a 4, 4 in that case is a good idea or not. Um, but that's what I want to do anyway. And since I'm the speaker, uh, that's what I did. And now this is how you do it. And you can see that it's not about an if else anymore. Now we must have this API. And that's what I told you before, um, that you, you must really know the API very well. So this is how you read it. Repository, now the repository is reactive, which is good. And we say find by ID. And so this returns a mono of a person, which is cool. Now this mono can wrap an entity if it was found in the database, or it can wrap nothing if it was not found in the database. And in that case, I want to say, oh, I will throw an exception. So what I need to do is I need to call this method called switch is empty. And switch is empty like 
at the time where the mono of person will be requested, that you that uh, the runtime will see that there is nothing inside, it will switch to this new mono. And this mono is actually a mono of error that wraps like a provider of response status exception not found. So now if I call for an entity that is not existing, I will get this 4.4. Oh, I can do it now. Let's try. Let's try it. I, I'm I'm playful today. I just want uh, to check that uh, it still works as expected and to convince you as well. And that's much better. I think that Firefox was using a lot of my resources. So clear. Nah, too fast. Too fast. Be nice to me, please. Too fast. Yes, it still works. So now I have my like normal path. And now if I request for like entity number 15, it tells me, hey, you've got a 404 error. So what happened, as I mentioned, is when the, it requested the mono of person, it, it, it uh, realized that it was empty. And then it switched to this other like path. That's good. Um, and, and that's something that I didn't do in the beginning. So that's an additional capability, which is always good. And also, it got you familiar, familiarized with how you can do like if else in the reactive world. Now, I want to add caching again because, hey, I'm, I really want to have caching. My database is very remote. I want uh, to have uh, improved performance because I'm doing microservices or whatever. And now I, I, I will add something that I, I didn't have before. And every Spring project must have one. It's a service layer. Every Spring project must have a service layer. If you, if you don't have a service layer, it's not a Spring project. Uh, I, I'm joking, by the way. And don't, don't believe everything I say. Um, but here, it's very convenient. I will add this uh, service. And what I will be doing is it, this service will be like inserted between uh, the routes and the repository. So uh, the route will actually call uh, this service. The service will first check when you find by ID, hey, is it in the cache? And if it's in the if it's not in the cache, then it will get back to the repository and then it will return um, a mono on success. And if it's in the cache, it will return the mono and wrapping just a person. And of course, you can do the same with final, just with less logging because that would be pretty useless. So let's start it and let's see how it works because this one is very interesting. And um, here, I, I, some of you might say, oh, but it's strange. Like here I'm doing like blocking calls and that's correct. You are doing blocking calls. And how will my application react if I do blocking calls? Well, my application fails, like it harshly fails. Why is that? Normally it should work, but because I added block hounds in the previous um, in, in the previous uh, step, it tells me, hey, like you have a blocking cow, that's not a, a load. And you can see that here I have the call stack and you can see where it fails. So here it's my code and you can see here, I'm doing get, this is pretty, pretty bad. You shouldn't do get because this is a blocking call. And in this thread, it's not a load. So the next step is, to fix that and to use uh, the reactive API to do it in a proper way. So I refactor what I did. I, I, I keep the, the caching layer, but I actually use the reactive API to do what I did just before. And now we, we will be using like a sync. So the good thing is that uh, Hazelcast has an async API. The not so good side is that it returns a completion stage, and completion stage is an old class that probably you are not using anymore. But uh, we have a wrapper, so you can create a mono from a completion stage. So we will wrap this completion stage, or let's say the supplier of completion stage, uh, into a mono. And then, and this is how it reads like if it contains something, you will call this do on next then you will log that, yeah, the entity was found in the cache. And if it's empty, and we already saw that um, actually if it's empty, we can call switch if it's empty, 
we will find it from the repository. And if we find it in the repository, then the next stuff that we will do is we will put it asynchronously in the cache and we will log it. And likewise, again, no logging on the final, but uh, on every next, you can put it asynchronously into the cache. So you can, like, if you uh, get all entities, then you can call one by key. It will be in the cache already, which is not might be what you want or not. Um, that depends on your use case. So I will get, just get back to the terminal and clear that because there is a lot of craft here. So I will call it, and we can see here in the log that the person with ID one was set in the cache because uh, we retrieved it from the database. And now if we call it again, now it's found in the cache and there is no interaction with the database. So we got back our, um, our code as before, but of course um, it's a lot more involved. It's not just about Hibernate interaction, uh, it's about you doing that explicitly. And my camera just froze, so now I'm, I don't know if you see me anymore. I hope you do. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be fun. Um, and this is uh, like close to the end. I will uh, stop uh, sharing my camera, I believe, because I believe my camera is really, really bad. So I will stop the video stream. I hope you see me better now, or at least you see the slides. So in this talk, uh, this is um, just what I wanted to show you. Uh, if you want to migrate from WebMVC to, Web uh, to um, WebFlux, you will uh, need to migrate uh, to functional APIs first, because just to understand that it's a different model. If you just keep the annotation and change the underlying engine, it's possible, but um, then it, there will be issues at a later point. Um, if you uh, want to be reactive, everything in the cold chain needs to be reactive. You just cannot decide, hey, just make reactive the, the, the web port. Uh, if the data access port is not reactive and not every um, that database as reactive API, then just don't aim for reactive. If you want to ensure that everything is reactive, I would really, really um, uh, advise you to use block hands because as you can, uh, as you could see, uh, it tells you good advices. Uh, hey, you had a blocking call here, and so your uh, application is not reactive. It's more work, but it's not impossible. Um, but as engineers, you should really, really uh, uh, evaluate like the benefits and the costs. Uh, if you are using Kotlin. Well, just use coroutines, but this was a talk in Java. And more importantly, please don't use reactive because other uh, are doing it because you want it to put on your resume or for whatever reason, um, just use reactive because it makes sense in your context. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, you can read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, as I mentioned, you can get the codes um, here. Uh, so you can try it at home. And if by any chance you are interested in the Hazel cards, you can join our Slack or get some free training. So now I will try to put back my video and hope that it works and that you can still see me and that I'm not frozen. And perhaps you have some questions. Hello, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Nicola. That was an amazing presentation. Yes, right now we can see you. Uh, if you are on Slack, please fire your question. If you're on YouTube, please fire your question. So uh, follow him on Twitter because he's a nice, he, he has amazing content to share about the Java community and the software development as well. So let's wait for a couple points. I'm always afraid when I have no questions. So either it, it was the best talk ever, it was super clear, straight to the point, so no questions necessary, or it was the worst talk ever and people don't want to shame me into asking questions that will make me realize that. So if I have at least one question that is not related to my hardware, it would be nice. That was an amazing presentation. I enjoy a lot, especially when you talk about the reactive in the relationship with Java 9, and you focus more on Spring, right? Uh, do you believe there is any feature to do this exactly some API to Jakarta here, MicroProfile? Uh, 
And you might know that I'm not super involved in Jakarta or Java E since quite a couple of years. I'm a Spring Boot fanboy, and I actually I'm a bit moving away from Java as well toward more Kotlin. Um, I, I believe that if MicroProfile or Jakarta E, and I hope they merge at some point, but that's another debate, uh, like offer something that uh, is more reactive oriented, it will fit nicely into the picture of microservices. Like for most of the real microservices workload, not the, hey, let's have a distributed monolith, but real microservices, like the, the, the reactive world is actually, as I mentioned, a much better fit cost-wise, like on okay. the hardware part. We but have again, one you must question. balance Sorry, it. go ahead. Sorry, you, you must balance it with the cost of migrating to, uh, to reactive, meaning that you must train your teams, that you will have a harder, uh, like a harder to manage mental model, that it will be harder to debug, whatever. So it, it, you must really like carefully evaluate everything. Uh, the first question from the audience, what is coroutine of Kotlin? <laughs> Well, that's a long question. Um, the the, the coroutine model is actually an API in in in, um, in Kotlin that lets you pretend that you are writing like codes like in the same sequential way, but what happens is is done in parallel. Uh, so yes, I, I I should probably remove that that lines from the slides uh, when I'm doing the talk in Java. Um, but if you can check, it's, I mean, if you already are working in Kotlin, I believe um, that, that you are already familiar with it. If you are not, just check it. It's really interesting. That's what I would like every API to be like. Hey, it's very, to, it's very easy to use and it tackles hard problems for you that you don't need to handle like, threading by yourself. So it's just an abstraction layer, but the, the way you write code is much easier to understand, in my opinion. Okay, one more question from Xavier. In each case, should we consider reactive? Oh, I try. I, I tried to tell it several times. Like, um, in what case you shouldn't, first because it's high, first because it scales. Those are two wrong reasons. So in what case, well, if your team is already composed of reactive programmers and you need to train a few people, that could be a nice that uh, a nice context. Otherwise, if you are not trained in reactive, then probably you will evaluate that um, the benefits of using reactive are actually will earn you more money, the return over investment of migrating is higher than zero. Because on one side, again, as I mentioned, it will be harder to develop, harder to maintain, harder to debug, harder to reason about. So that has a cost. And this cost is hard, actually, to evaluate. On the other side, you will probably like uh, get some money back from your cloud provider. If you are running on-premise, I believe that there is not really a strong reason to migrate unless you want first to try it out in your on your own premise before migrating to the cloud then it could be it could be a use case but i believe you are all engineers um, so evaluating the pros and the cons of any solution uh, is pretty a way of life for you i don't hear you you are muted otavio ouch sorry Sometimes I hate technology. <laughs> okay, if there's no questions, so let me check again. Oh, sorry, my dog. That's fine. Uh, that's the issue with the online conference, right? So if there's no questions, so let me check again. Give once, give twice. So, Nicholas, thank you. Thanks Everybody a lot for having me. Presentation. That includes my dog right now, celebrating to your presentation. And see you, <laughs> yeah, see you soon in the next conference. I hope so, yeah. And guys, stay with us, and we're going to take a break of 10 minutes. And uh, have a nice day. Enjoy.
See you soon. Hope so.